Good morning and a big welcome to all our participants who join us today uh, virtually at our session at the European Health Forum Gastein. Uh, this is the first session actually that is going live, so we are really excited about this. It's a great, great pleasure to co-host this session uh, with my friend Matthias Wismar from the European Observatory on Health Systems and Policies. My name is Ilana Ventura and I'm working at the Ministry, at the Austrian Ministry of Social Affairs, Health, Care and Consumer Protection. Our session will focus on resilience of health systems as the title reveals. And we will talk about key aspects such as absorbing shocks, preparing for crisis and how to recover from this crisis. Why did we choose this topic uh, for our session? Well, 2020 was a really unique year all, over, all around the world. The worldwide health crisis and general crisis caused by COVID-19 has led to unprecedented challenges faced by governments all around the world. And different countries have reacted and responded in different ways to these challenges. So today we want to explore three country examples, which are Germany, Sweden and Austria, and hear about their unique experiences and lessons learned in tackling this crisis. We also hope to hear about the views and um, thoughts in regards to resilience in crisis management in the health systems. For our session, we have defined three objectives. We want to learn what health system resilience actually means. We want to understand which concrete measures are especially relevant to resilient health systems. And we want to comprehend which kind of resilience response corresponds to which kind of shock or crisis. So now I would like to ask my uh, colleague Matthias to quickly give a, guide us through the agenda, introduce our amazing speakers and explain the format uh, to our participants. Thank you so much, Ilana. Uh, my name is Matthias Wismar and I'm today your co-facilitator. And just a couple of words about the format. It is online and we know that a large number of people are participating in this, but we try to be as um, as much involving you as participants, as much interactive as possible. So we are using today mainly the question and answers for comments. Please send your comments. We will check them and we have two moments where we can collect and where we can feedback comments to the speakers and uh, the panelists. With regards to the session agenda, we will start with a welcome address and a quite interesting uh, video clip actually from the Austrian minister, um, Mr. Anschober. And uh, that will be followed by a keynote, and the keynote is really about understanding what are we talking about when we use the term resilience. What are the different dimensions of resilience? You know, when does resilience actually matter? And uh, this will be, and this will be followed then by a panel discussion, and um, uh, then we have time actually for your comments and for feeding back your comments and questions to the panelists. Talking about the presenters and the panelists. I have to start with my colleague, Anna Sagan. Anna Sagan has been deeply involved in the research on um, health systems resilience. What is it? When does it matter? Uh, what do we know about it scientifically? And she will give us a brief presentation on this. And then we have three excellent panelists. I think some of them you actually already know. Olivia Wixel from Sweden. She is the director at the National Board of Health and Welfare. And she has been in the past in many, many uh, leading positions in the um, Swedish health um, system. We have also um, on board um, uh, Stefan Eichwalder from the Austrian Ministry um, of Health. He was until, I think it was January, um, a member of the cabinet of the health minister. Um, and then he is now a head of unit for DRGs and health economics, but he's very much involved in the COVID-19 um, response. And now, last but not least, um, we have today with us from the German Ministry of Health, uh, Dr. Hans Ulrich Hotel. He has a very colorful um, CV, and he is now um, the head of the Director General for Health Security, Health Protection and Sustainability. And I think that makes it a really perfect match to talk about resilience in particular in the times of um, uh, pandemic and crisis. So that's um, the format, the program and the speakers. And I give over to you, uh, Ilana. 
Yes, a quick word maybe to, to the interactive part. So um, comments should be um, mentioned, like written down at the Q&A section. Um, and there we can then pick them out, so to say. So uh, as Matthias already said, uh, we are really excited that uh, Minister of Health uh, Rudolf Anschubert sent us a personal message explaining his uh, perspective and also his experiences uh, during this time of crisis which actually happened right after he took office in January 2020. So we will have this video, which might take a few seconds. Dear 100 guests, it was January 7th, 2020, I moved in at Stubenring 1 as Federal Minister of Social Affairs, Health, Care and Consumer Protection with great joy, but also with high respect for the office. I had set myself a vast number of goals. The redesign of provision of care had to be tackled urgently, combating the increase of social inequality. More intensively was necessary and I also wanted to set new priorities in the health care sector in general. But then things took a different path, as you know. Pretty much right after I took office, we received reports from China where thousands of people in the Wuhan region had been infected with a novel coronavirus. My experts and I, in close coordination with the WHO and the European partners, observed the virus development very closely. I knew from the beginning that viruses do not stop at continents nor at country borders. I was alert. On January 24th, the time had come. SARS-CoV-2, the severe acute respir respiratory syndrome, had reached Europe. First infections were reported from France. Our government set up a crisis unit in the Federal Ministry of Internal Affairs. We started our preparations. In mid-February, the virus was just around the gates of Austria, in Veneto and Lombardy. The number of infections increased dramatically. I put my house into crisis mode. We set up a crisis unit, an advisory task force with the best experts in the country, viral virologists, public health experts, simulation experts, etc., etc. They started their work as a first-class advisory body. By now, the WHO had upgraded the epidemic to a global pandemic. A threat situation neither Europe nor Austria has seen in this dimension and to this extent in the past 100 years. We entered a new territory. On February 25th, it was clear. With two confirmed cases in Innsbruck, the virus had arrived in Austria. At the beginning of the pandemic, many things were unclear. Many questions have cleared up, yet many remain open. How dangerous is the virus really? What are the long-term consequences? Which treatment, as long as there is no specific drug, is the right one? When taking measures, we always need to ponder and find balance between health protection and the economy as well as a carefree, everyday life. Fact is, however, that this is the worst pandemic in a century, leading to the worst global recession in 90 years. I am convinced that solving the health crisis is a prerequisite for the economic comeback. It might sound surprising, but I see a lot of genuine understanding of the number one priority, the health. It is amazing to feel that. It is amazing to hear that we need a strong health system. You can see how poorly states that have weakened their health systems through privatization and budget cuts are doing now. The high number of our hospital and intensive care beds has proved to be an asset during the crisis, in spite of having been the subject of severe controversy over the last few years. 
We are still constantly learning how this virus works and what it does. But the past few months have certainly shown us several things. Social cohesion and solidarity are essential aspects to tackling the pandemic. Cooperation is needed across different sectors and responsibilities, regions and states, because we can only solve this crisis together, together as a society, but also together as a European community. A positive example here is the joint EU-wide procurement of the COVID-19 vaccine. Everyone is pulling together because we know that together we are stronger than alone. And resilience is the most important aspect in the handling of a crisis challenge, especially with regard to COVID-19. We are not there yet. The pandemic is not over. Until there is a vaccine or a specific medication, we must persevere and consistently keep our distance, wear mouth, mouth, nose protection and wash hands frequently. But if we take care of each other, we will get through this crisis well. So we see that was a very personal um, message and showing his perspective, summarizing the biggest, biggest challenges really, and also uh, uh, explaining these numerous uncertainties that many, many governments face and uh, have faced. And I think it was really um, fantastic that he prioritized uh, health here uh, so clearly. And uh, our minister also gave us already a few thoughts in regards to resilience when it comes to social cohesion, solidarity, cross-sector cooperation, and basically um, working together and overcoming the crisis. Thank you so much. Yes, absolutely. And I think it was quite impressive, actually. And uh, he was talking about the dimension. It was also very interesting to see that he said all his priorities, he came into office, you know, he had to put aside and focus really mm -hmm. on the pandemic. And he said, uh, what is now important is strong health systems. And I think that is a real bridge, you know, to the presentation we are having now from uh, Anna Zagan, you know, who will tell us about the resilience of health systems and uh, where this resilience actually sits. Anna, the floor is all yours. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's a great pleasure um, to be here today uh, virtually um, and contribute to this um, very uh, interesting uh, webinar. Um, thank you for having me. Um, my job today is to um, help um, kickstart the discussions um, by outlining um, the concept of resilience uh, and how this concept um, can be applied to understanding responses um, to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, I will be drawing um, here on our conceptual brief on resilience, which you can see uh, the cover of uh, on the right hand side. Um, this brief was published earlier today, um, and I will also tell you a little bit about our uh, other resilience work that we are doing now. Um, if I asked you what resilience means, you could all probably um, give me an answer, as this is um, a concept that we use uh, in everyday language. Um, commonly, we understand um, resilience as the capacity to recover um, from a shock uh, or bounce back. Um, this can refer to animals, humans, materials. And over the year, uh, this concept has trickled uh, to other fields, including um, in the last um, 20 or so years um, to um, our analysis of health systems. Uh, but our understanding of resilience is a little bit less clear here. Um, and we are lacking a single um, definition um, that is uh, widely accepted. Uh, most definitions are a little bit similar to the one that I'm showing on top of the slide. Um, and focus on health system preparedness and its ability to respond to an acute shock. Um, but over the years, um, as the literature on this topic has grown, um, the definitions have also expanded. Um, and some definitions are now also looking at how to minimize exposure, meaning risk, um, or how to address um, uh, health system strains or stresses um, that are more predictable and more um, enduring. Um, in our policy brief, we adopt uh, a narrower definition, the one that you see uh, on this slide. Um, this is for um, operational reasons, uh, but also because health system responses will be different um, in the face of a shock that is acute, such as COVID-19, um, compared to a shock, uh, a strain um, that is uh, more predict predictable and enduring, such as uh, population aging, for example. 
Um, so we understand resilience as um, ability to prepare, manage, and learn from shocks. And um, as already hinted uh, by a shock, um, we understand a sudden and extreme disturbance, such as epidemic, uh, a natural disaster, or a financial crisis. And um, as you can see on this little um, circle of picture below, uh, we understand the shock in a dynamic way as a cycle uh, that consists of four stages that feed into each other. Although in practice, I will, as I will show um, in a minute, um, things can be more complicated. So just walking you through this um, um, diagram, stage one preparedness, which is um, the green circle at the top, um, is related to how vulnerable a system is to various disturbances. Um, in this phase, the system needs to get ready for shocks before they happen and identify um, ideal responses. Um, but actually experiencing a shock is not necessary for a, head, uh, for a health system to be considered resilient. Um, a resilient uh, health system may be one that is prepared for a shock, but this shock might not necessarily happen. Now, moving on to the next stage, the yellow one, um, the focus here is on identifying uh, the start and type of the shock. Um, so as we have seen um, with COVID, the earlier we realize that a shock is happening, the faster and more effective our response can be. Um, this requires um, comprehensive surveillance and early warning systems. Um, now, moving on to the third stage is um, when we actually manage the shock. So the shock is already here. Um, the health system now needs to absorb the shock um, and where it is necessary, also adapt or even more profoundly transform um, to ensure that the health system is still meeting its, um, its goals. Um, this stage um, is what um, the definitions of um, resilience have traditionally um, focused on. Um, and from the perspective of health systems uh, performance, uh, resilience uh, therefore goes beyond um, just bouncing back to where we were before, but also it means health systems ability um, to transform and evolve, um, ideally into something better than what we had before. And finally, Moving back to the last stage, um, this is where we return to some kind of normality, but there might still be um, uh, changes as a legacy of the shock. And you can see um, the, the circle has closed. We are moving uh, from uh, the shock, uh, the, the, the stage the stage four, um, which is recovery, into preparedness for the next uh, uh, shock cycle as the loop, um, uh, we go through the loop again. Um, so here on this slide, um, I wanted to uh, draw on the um, hammer and dance uh, figure, which many of you might have already seen in other places, just to highlight um, the specificity of the uh, COVID um, shock. Uh, it is a complex shock. Um, first, um, uh, many countries try to break the transmission of infection uh, by implementing harsh me hard, very harsh measures, such as lockdowns. Um, um, these measures are commonly known as the hammer, therefore a, a picture of a hammer at top of the figure. Um, and we, these measures were meant to flatten the orange curve to protect the health systems from breaking, from exceeding uh, its capacity, and essentially to buy us time uh, to prepare a little bit better. Um, the curve was then meant to stay at some manageable level until effective treatments or uh, vaccines become widely available. Uh, and this would push um, the curve further down. Um, but as you can see, this is not um, the case in many countries. And instead, we might have to deal with um, periods of surges, uh, which can be local, um, and periods of lower uh, incidence, um, where some degree of recovery is possible. So you, you can see the curve goes kind of up and down and fluctuates. Um, so as such, we are dealing with a shock that uh, seems to comprise smaller shocks within itself. And another complication already mentioned by the minister is um, the global economic crisis. Um, a second shock has started before we had a chance to recover from the pandemic. And so we are dealing now with two major shocks um, that are overlapping. Um, but having this complexity doesn't mean that we cannot draw lessons from the responses so far. And in fact, many people, including ourselves, are trying to do so. And um, to that end, uh, we use information that we collect in um, systematically to our, our dedicated um, COVID um, monitor platform. I will show you um, 
uh, a picture of the spell from at the end. Um, now on the, this and the next slide, uh, which I apologize are very busy, uh, but I'm not going to go through them uh, in detail. You can see um, broad resilience um, enhancing strategies that we have um, identified um, so far. Um, so we group them um, by health system function that they are uh, most likely to fall under, although of course there are um, overlaps. Uh, so we categorize them into governance, financing, resources, and service um, delivery. So you see the, the strategies, there are 13 strategies in total. You see them on, uh, on these uh, slides. That's the second set. Um, and on the right-hand side, um, we go uh, one step further and try to thresh out the key elements um, of, this, uh, of these strategies um, based uh, from our um, knowledge of the country responses to COVID. Um, and this is, of course, work in progress. And um, it's just meant to give you a little sneak peek into our uh, forthcoming policy brief um, on COVID-19 and resilience. And we will continue auditing these um, lessons, these strategies and elements um, in the brief. Um, we will also supplement them with um, specific country examples. And I'm not going to go through these um, one by one. Uh, instead, um, I wanted to offer some uh, broad lessons um, uh, uh, that we have drawn from all this um, so far, and they resonate very much with what the minister um, has just said. So here are the uh, three lessons. So um, we found the key aspects of resilient COVID um, response um, can well are simplistically twofold. Um, one, having technical capacity to respond, and two, um, having appropriate and effective governance to do so. And of these two aspects, we have found governance um, to be the necessary condition for any effective response. Um, and Matthias is our um, governance expert um, at the observatory, so um, he can tell you more. Um, but I just wanted to um, say here that governance helps create trust in the system. Um, it enables um, other functions to um, uh, health system functions to work properly, and it contributes to the strengthening of the system as a whole. Um, so we have seen um, there are countries um, with um, less technical uh, capacity than some others, but with um, which had leaders who listened to the science and acted fast. Um, and these countries have been mu uh, much more successful in containing the, the virus than some others with more capacity. Um, and we have seen that some of the um, worst hit countries were those that had um, populist leaders, um, political troubles, um, uh, disinformation campaigns um, where media was silenced and health professionals uh, were silenced, etc. Um, and of course, there are no easy fixes um, to this in the short term, um, as there are no, there might be no way to avoid a bad leader um, or get rid of them. Um, uh, but there are things that we can do to strengthen um, governance now. Um, for example, within the health system, um, we can put in place um, coordination channels. Um, or draw plans and keep them updated to um, ensure effective response. So the second lesson um, is what the minister pretty much has said already. Um, the pandemic has exposed um, differences in vulnerability within countries. Um, and we have seen the most advantaged, disadvantaged um, population groups um, bearing the greatest uh, burden uh, of, the, of the pandemic. Um, and we have seen that countries with stronger uh, social safety nets um, have generally uh, performed better. Um, the pandemic has really shown us that we are not safe until everybody is um, safe, including people um, who work at um, slaughterhouses and uh, meatpacking plants. Um, the pandemic has also um, exposed um, differences in uh, vulnerability across countries. Uh, and we have learned that no country is um, safe until every country is safe. Um, and there is, of course, um, some degree of self-sufficiency that um, is desirable. Um, for example, having national stocks of um, medical supplies um, and production capacity. Um, but in the end, um, countries need to cooperate um, to ensure resilience in the face of a global uh, shock such as COVID-19. Um, and we can all benefit from better global surveillance and notification systems, from more cooperation in procurement, from um, better cooperation in medical research, sharing best practices, um, and better um, global governance um, in general. And finally, 
Um, my final um, lesson for today is that um, we have long known about a risk of, um, um, of an epidemic from zoonotic viruses such as um, COVID, but we haven't really done enough to be prepared uh, for, for, for this pandemic. Um, and now we look back and we try to um, learn from what has happened to prepare for the next pandemic. But there are other risks that we already know, um, such as antimicrobial resistance. And yet uh, we kind of seem to wait um, for these um, uh, to happen um, before we actually really act. Um, so to be truly resilient, uh, besides looking back for lessons, we also need to look um, forwards um, and do more to address the the, the risks um, that we already know. Um, uh, finally, um, in the efforts to learn from the pandemic, um, we can see a little bit um, a shift of focus from um, just trying to understand um, how to best manage it uh, now, immediately, um, to trying to understand better how to build back better um, for the longer term so that at the end of it, we emerge um, stronger and um, better prepared for similar events in the future. And these efforts are increasingly um, taking a more holistic approach um, that go beyond strengthening um, health systems. Um, and they incorporate, um, as we see in some um, international um, uh, documents or plans, um, they incorporate some social, economic, green, um, and other dimensions, and they take into account global trends such as um, uh, digitalization, for example. And um, this is a recognition that um, health system is um, just one system among many interconnected systems. Um, and strategies to enhance um, health system resilience, um, therefore, needs to be part of such a broader um, multi-sectoral or holistic um, approach. And that's the last slide where I just wanted to show you um, a little advertisement for our um, uh, COVID uh, monitor platform where we uh, collect information um, and also um, put up some analysis about um, national responses to the pandemic. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anna. So um, we have already a question and I want just to encourage um, people to, to be a bit more interactive maybe. We really want to have this as an interactive session, so don't be shy, ask your questions in the Q&A section, please, and we will forward them. And I would have now here a question in regards um, to governance. Uh, Anna, maybe you could elaborate a bit on, on the governance aspect that um, is one aspect that improves um, um, the outbreak management or makes it more effective. Um, other concrete examples? Is there anything you could elaborate a bit more in this um, aspect? Maybe but we um, ask her to come on board for the discussion when we ask the panelists and uh, we retain the, the question until then. So um, so in that case, you know, I would like to now invite our um, uh, panelists. I think we got a lot of input from, from Anna, both on the shocks and the um, resilience as uh, terminology and the different dimensions and strategies. And I heard things like trust, intelligence, analysis, decision making, leadership, coordination, um, safety nets, social safety nets, but also that no country is actually safe on its own, but that there's also some, some need for joint responses in terms to be resilient to um, crisis. And I think we've seen this in the past, and that's probably also the way forward in the future that we need to uh, work together on a couple of issues. So the first speaker I would like now to invite is Hans, Dr. Hans-Ulrich Hultam from the um, Federal Ministry of Health. Hans-Ulrich, please, the floor is all yours. So again, good morning, everybody. I hope uh, you can hear me. Yes. That's perfect. So uh, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to, uh, to have the opportunity to, to speak to you on this EFHG uh, webinar on health systems resilience. And I'm happy to share the, the experiences that we so far had uh, in, in combating this, uh, this um, health crisis. Uh, and um, I will try to explain uh, what factors uh, are influencing health system resilience uh, in Germany. But first of all, let me say we're in the middle of this pandemic. It is uh, far too early to draw decisive conclusions. 
and uh, to take all the lessons learned, we have big steps to take when it comes to vaccine development, when it comes to tackle the, the second waves that we see in, uh, in several countries, not only in Europe. Uh, so uh, we shouldn't be too, uh, yeah, too early to think that we know it all and that we uh, now can look back in, in, in order to prepare better and to build back better. Uh, we have a long way to go. We, we compare it to a marathon and I think we, we, maybe we have reached half line of it. So uh, we better prepare to, to, for the uh, winter. Um, I'm going to present the view of the German Ministry of Health. Um, so, and I'm looking, uh, I, will, I will look at all sectors uh, of our healthcare system. Um, and uh, let me start with the four phases uh, as we experience it in Germany, because we have a new virus uh, of course, we knew coronaviruses, we knew influenza viruses, we knew and we were prepared for pandemics of, of those, but this was a new one. So the first phase of the crisis starting in uh, end of December and then January, February, uh, it was uh, really uh, a phase of insecurity and sensitization. Even our best experts, you, you know, maybe from the media, Professor Drosten from the Charité Hospital in Berlin. He's one of the world's most renowned uh, corona um, uh, scientists. Uh, he has written a lot and, and uh, done a lot of scientific work with uh, the SARS-1 uh, uh, virus, with the MERS virus. And he thought um, till middle uh, February that we, we would have no big impact of this because this virus is replicating in the deeper uh, parts of the lungs and the infectivity and attack rate is not so high and he was proven wrong and um, I heard that uh, dealing with insecurity is a very important part of, uh, of trust, uh, of trust building, of communication and I think uh, we should learn to listen to the scientific uh, experts and we should definitely uh, we, we, we will have to learn with insecurity. Um, then um, from March on, it was clear we have a very dangerous virus, high attack rate, uh, and then the phase of decisive action and the way to the lockdown uh, was, uh, was dominating the scene. Uh, but just let me just say a lockdown is uh, not a defined uh, phrase. Uh, we have the Swedish example, and I'm, I'm happy to hear more about this from our Swedish colleague later. We have the German example, which is pretty much in between different lockdown scenarios. And we have very hard and strict lockdowns, as we have seen in Spain, in France, uh, with curfews. We never had a curfew in Germany. And, and I think it's good that different countries deal with the pandemic uh, um, adapted to the situation that they see uh, in this. The third phase, as we see, it was the step-by-step -step ease of restrictions and we experienced that deciding on a lockdown is easy deciding how to get out of this lockdown with what measures opening schools opening companies opening uh, nursery or elderly homes this was a very difficult phase where we had a lot of discussion and where we had a lot of participation with the communities and so on um, this was a phase when in Germany, as you know, we have a very strong federal system and I think this federal system is one of the strength uh, and, and uh, a factor of resilience in Germany that we have uh, locally adapted um, uh, opportunities to react. We have uh, federal states like in northeastern Germany, which are hardly affected, and we have uh, states like uh, Baden-Württemberg or Bavaria, uh, which have a high infection rate, and of course we need to um, to specify the uh, the actions that there cannot be a central decision uh, on a, uh, on a whole country. Uh, I think this was a part of the strength, and uh, during this phase we have uh, federalized responsibility to the prime ministers of the of the respective federal states. And this was a very important phase and we still are in this federalization responsibility. Uh, and now we're in the phase four, targeted restriction and preparation for autumn and winter, including of course, uh, the, the preparation of the rollout of the vaccination, procurement of the vaccines and so on. The different sectors of the German health system were affected um, differently at, uh, at the specific phases. Let me just uh, very briefly explain uh, our three main pillars of the German healthcare system. The first, the primary care, the outpatient care. We have a widespread 
network of, uh, of medical offices, uh, public, private um, mix. I think this is good that we have a public, private mix. One very important thing we have very easy access to healthcare in Germany. Everybody has a health, has a health insurance um, and every person throughout the whole spectrum of, of social um, um, abilities have access to the healthcare system. I think this is a very strong part uh, of resilience that you have no restriction uh, on how to get healthcare. The second pillar, the hospital system. Again, we have in every county uh, a hospital uh, we have uh, university hospitals spread out through Germany. Again, this is part of federalization. Every county mayor uh, uh, wants to have his hospital. We were in a phase before the pandemic to cut down on hospital capability. Um, we are rethinking now, uh, build back better. And uh, we think that it was good that uh, some decisions haven't, hadn't been executed before this crisis. We have uh, more than three, uh, 30,000 ICU beds. And during the high phase of the pandemic in March, when we were really uh, afraid that the situation could get out of hand, as we have seen in some of our um, uh, neighbor countries, uh, we were happy to have this capability and we uh, capacity and we, we even uh, expanded it. And uh, third, but not last, our public health system. Um, I think the, the majority of Germans never heard about the, the term uh, Amtsarzt or uh, Öffentlicher Gesundheitsdienst, public health. It has no real tradition in Germany, but we saw that for the, uh, for the very important role of contact tracing, uh, infection chain uh, breaking, these local and again, strictly federalized. Yes, we have the Ministry of Health, it's a strategic um, decision-making institution. We have our Robert Koch Institute, our National uh, Public Health Institute. But then down we have in every um, federal state, we have public health agencies, offices. And in every federal state, in every county, we have these public health offices. And their role was to, to clear the contact tracing and the infection chains. And they have been... Um, um, significantly um, enforced um, very rapidly during the phase in March, April, and we will do it uh, uh, substantially and very um, uh, sustainable in the next years with a high uh, impact on these uh, federal public health offices that we, because we have seen the importance of it. And this is not only true for COVID-19, but for every other pandemic that might come and they will come. Um, so during these uh, phases, now that you know the different sectors, the three main pillars of the German uh, healthcare system, of course, during the first phase, insecurity and sensitization, we were happy to have in this primary sector a public, privately uh, organized network system of uh, laboratories. You know that the first inject in Germany was by a Chinese businesswoman uh, uh, working for a German company in Bavaria. And uh, I think this was lucky for Germany that we had this case because this really sensitized that something is coming, uh, that we need laboratories, that we need PCR tests uh, and uh, it was perfectly dealt uh, uh, with uh, through the Bavarian public health, local public health offices. They were uh, able to contact trace every uh, exposed person. They quarantined them, the, the infected were hospitalized and isolated and this was completely contained this uh, this uh, event and it was you could call it a super spreading event because there were more than uh, 16 infections by one person uh, so i think this was a very important thing that we sensitized uh, the society and and the system um, then uh, later with uh, skiers coming back from austria from italy um, uh, we got um, an overwhelming um, inject of uh, uh, COVID-19 cases. And this was again driven by Carnival. You know, Germany uh, has some uh, uh, Carnival uh, traditions, especially, especially in the Rhine Valley, uh, Cologne and Aachen. And you have heard about the super spreading event in Heinsberg, a small uh, the town. And again, we have uh, uh, strong beer festivals in, in Bavaria. And this was a driving factor in Bavaria, uh, super spreading events that led to a lockdown of some uh, villages because they, had, they, they were overwhelmingly affected by this crisis. Um, 
Now, the second part of our system, the, uh, uh, the uh, primary care system. The primary care system dealt with more than 85, 90% of the cases. Uh, this, is, uh, this was very good because gladly we see uh, a lot of mild or, uh, or low symptomatic cases and they could be dealt with with our uh, primary care system. They, need, they didn't go to the hospitals, they didn't uh, affect the hospitals. So that, uh, that um, made it much easier for the hospitals to take care of the re really severe cases and the ICU and ventilation cases. So the mix of primary care system, public health system, locally organized and a good hospital capacity uh, led us and helped us through this uh, first phase. Uh, secondly, uh, the lockdown, and you have uh, talked about the importance of good governance. I can completely underline uh, your, uh, your explanations. Uh, you need clear communication, you need uh, clear communication about insecurity when it is there. You, I think it's not good to say, we will lead you through this, we know it all, and uh, we, we will we will make sure that we are strong. We have some examples around the world. People who did that, they failed. Uh, you need to be open and transparent and uh, trustworthy in the communication with the public. Otherwise, you, uh, you cannot do this. Um, Science-driven governance decision. I think very important um, that you listen to the evidence, that you listen to the specialists, not only on the medical side, but on the economic side. And uh, I think uh, that was done in Germany, uh, a clear consultation, a repetitive consultation. Uh, whenever new scientific evidence came, uh, it was incorporated into the decisions. Uh, so good governance, a, a very important, especially during this lockdown. I mean, you, you are cutting down um, uh, basic rights, human rights, the right to to go to church and, and all, Germany has never seen um, a, a, a shutdown and, and cut down on, on uh, liberties like uh, during this crisis. And if you do not communicate and if you're not trustworthy, uh, I think uh, it, is, it will be very difficult to do this. Um, the federal systems, I already said, um, we had high incidence, low incidence regions, and I think the federal system and the federal responsibility to deal with, of course, there's always criticism. Uh, they, they call it a flickenteppich. I don't know how to translate it. People were, were angry because in, in some county uh, they couldn't uh, go to school in another county where they didn't work. Kids could go to school. Yes, it is difficult. It has to be explained. But I think it's, it's important that you only take strong measures uh, which are cutting um, uh, rights. Uh, when it is uh, necessary and uh, when uh, when it is uh, important uh, that that you have to do this in order to uh, flatten the curve in order to cut down the infections we scaled up the laboratory system i think testing had a very high importance to get a clear picture about uh, the pandemic um, so we are still in this in this phase of uh, yeah hammer and dance i heard um, just yesterday uh, the Chancellor Merkel met with all the prime ministers of the of the federal states, and they um, decided on the way, uh, the best way to go through uh, fall uh, and winter. Uh, and now we're looking, of course, all we're hoping that we will see a vaccine which is effective, uh, which is safe, uh, and which can be administered in a, in a good way. Uh, we are preparing for different scenarios because we don't know which vaccine will uh, finally succeed. Uh, do, will we do a, a central vaccination? How do we prioritize the different groups? Because we will not have enough vaccine for everybody. We will not have enough vaccine for the world. And very important what the previous speaker said, this pandemic will be over, not when it's over in Germany or in Sweden or in Switzerland or in Belgium. This pandemic will be over when the world will have access uh, and, and equal access to a vaccine and to a possibility to cope with this. So now we're talking again about indoor ventilation, um, restriction of social gatherings, prevention of super spreading events. Um, and we know that strict contact tracing and quarantine policies um, are important to lead us through winter. 
So I'm coming to the end. Sorry if I have taken too long. Um, uh, if you if you ask me what is the most important, I thought you would do a poll on what what uh, a special point is uh, is most important for resilience. I don't think that you can pick one single. The holistic approach that the previous speaker was uh, pointing to is uh, key. If you have a mix of all factors, you can compensate weaknesses in one of the of the others. The mix and the coordination between the different uh, sectors, in my opinion, is uh, is very important to um, to tackle this crisis. Uh, and again, I, I haven't elaborated a lot on economic uh, uh, measures. It's very important that people don't lose their jobs, don't lose their perspective and motivation. Uh, I think it's really, really important that you can that you do not um, compete healthcare and economics. Uh, you have to deal with both, and you have to spend a lot of money to give people security, um, social security, uh, so that they can find their way through the crisis. Um, yes, let me see if I have anything else on the on the list. Yeah. Yes, of course, digitalization. And last but not least, uh, I think digital tools are very important. You have heard about the different app solutions that we have. We have a digital system to monitor our uh, intensive care unit beds because it's not possible to prevent every infection. And I think we can live with a certain uh, number of infections, but we always should know the situation of uh, our healthcare system in order not to overwhelm it because this is a primary task of uh, the government to give everybody who needs intensive care treatment the, the, the possibility to receive it. At least it's the decision of the individual himself whether he wants or she wants it or not. But the, the possibility should be there. And we try to protect our hospital system, our ICU system uh, from overflowing so that everybody who needs this treatment could get it. I think that's uh, that's my input. Thank you very much. And I'm, I'm glad to hear your opinions on this. Thank you so much, uh, Hans Ulrich. I think that was a really fascinating account of um, uh, responding to the COVID-19 crisis. And as a some, couple of strengths you mentioned, uh, federalism, access to through the primary care system, but also a very dense hospital uh, system with high capacity. And we have rediscovered actually our public health systems, which uh, yes. showed to be very, very instrumental in this crisis. And, and, and the government has actually upscaled, you know, upscaled something which was probably underfunded in the years before. Yeah. There was plenty of stuff in it, you know, which we, I think, need to discuss um, later on, like dealing with the insecurity, acting very early. But you were also talking about the interface between science and policymakers. And, you know, in a way, most policymakers have talked to scientists and scientists have to policymakers, but the way they did it has differed in countries dramatically, Think I think, and we will hopefully get a couple of very interesting uh, examples from the other side. One thing I want to tell you all about the resilience thing is, if you look at the menu on the right-hand side, you see um, a menu item called handouts. We have for you uploaded the policy brief um, Anna has um, co-authored on the on the resilience. So, <coughs> so thank you so much, uh, Hans Ulrich. And now we come to our second speaker, Olivia Wixel, director of the National Board for Health and Wellcare. Olivia, the floor is all yours. You just need to unmute and turn on your camera. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and dear colleagues and friends and participants, and thank you so much for arranging this important seminar, webinar. And I would like to say something, of course, about the Swedish response strategy and also some of our learnings uh, on how to bounce back in a better shape, as Anna said in her introduction. Before the pandemic reached Europe, we activated our health emergency preparedness response. So we activated it quite early in Sweden. And we took a lot of decisions very early on to fortify our health system governance and also increase support to health workers facing the virus. Both the government and health uh, agencies set up uh, to work on creating a response that was sustainable and we thought very early on that we needed a sustainable response that would last for a long time and also, I mean, uh, gain trust in a long-term perspective. And we have now learned a lot of valuable lessons, but as Hans Ulrich said, uh, I mean, it's still 
early on to summarize those, but some of our lessons I will share with you. We scaled out <coughs> our health system by reallocating resources as many other countries because we knew from other countries that even, I mean, strong healthcare systems could be overwhelmed, but we have not faced that situation because we did a very heavy scale up. So we doubled our capacity ac actually in uh, intensive care units. And we had as a goal to, of course, protect the elderly and risk groups and to use social distancing and encourage people to stay at home instead of doing a complete lockdown of our society. And this was set in light of recommendations from expert agencies such as my, my uh, own agency and our public health agency. So in Sweden, expert agencies have had a really broad mandate to recommend both actions and other uh, things during the crisis. So we had had a knowledge-based uh, governance from the start in Sweden. That has been key for us. And therefore, we also have, of course, a discussion about, as you, you said, Matthias, the interface between knowledge-based governments, experts, and politician and value-based governments. So some, some part uh, or... Uh, it's sometimes also claimed that we should have more of a political governance, but we have had a knowledge-based governance in Sweden with this holistic approach. Uh, we know also from many countries that the amount of relatively young and middle-aged patients uh, are quite high that have been admitted to the ICUs. And in these groups, obesity, multimorbidity, socioeconomic factors have been highly contributing factors to uh, severe disease. And uh, areas with high degrees of socioeconomic risk factors, such as cramped housing, limited language skills, or entry-level contact jobs, were where infection spread quickly in the beginning of pandemic were severely affected. So. We have, of course, to learn from uh, these developments. And that goes back to the importance of having an equity and equality in your health uh, system as an aspect. We know the answer, and we, I mean, we know it that health inequality and inequity still is very much persistent in our society, also in Sweden, and we must continue to address those challenges also during a pandemic. Health literacy, promotion of healthy diets and exercise, help to stop smoking and other public health interventions, those are still important to invest in, and perhaps even more so now in the middle of this global crisis. And the crisis actually gives an opportunity to highlight the issue and the importance of public health investments. And not only because uh, it gives us a more uh, uh, in, uh, uh, more uh, of an uh, e equal health system, it's also uh, important to invest in, in uh, public health to be able to deal with the accumulated demand for health services, as you saw in the earlier presentation. We cannot deal it by only doing more in our health system of intervention and treatment, we must also invest at the same time more in public health. So the crisis highlighted the need for a necessary shift to focus more on health promotion and prevention in our health systems. And with a more targeted public health response, such as more focus on reducing obesity and support to stop smoking, perhaps these patients would have been uh, not so affected by the virus. And we have also learned that ensuring the information provided in ma many minority languages is also another factor that may contribute to a better and more equal pand pandemic response. <clears throat> um, yeah, I would also lay, like to say something about um, um, knowledge as um, uh, crucial to guide us during the pandemic. And we have provided a lot of tailored evidence-based guidance. And one thing that we have done in Sweden is to work with e-learning, so to reach the whole of the country. So, for example, more than 150,000 healthcare workers have been educated through e-learning courses on uh, hygiene standards. And this means the frog leap when it 
it comes to better knowledge on the basic health hy healthcare hygiene. So this is a learning also how we can really take those frog, li frog leaves when it comes to knowledge-based uh, care. And now our, I mean, uh, nursing homes, they are, their skills uh, are there when it comes to hygiene standards. And we have been able to build more resilient nursing homes also for the future, also for the seasonal flu and other kind of um, uh, spreads of um, uh, uh, viruses. <clears throat> Providing information, we heard from Germany, is very important. And uh, I mean, I think almost all countries that work with uh, daily press conferences or uh, daily communication in some way. And this communication is not only to, I mean, to guide the public or the civil society, it's also something that builds trust and transparency. And those are important values, especially in a crisis. Uh, and also, not to, I mean, um, communicate to contract misinformation is important because we know that we have sometimes discussed that the infodemic is a big problem, such a big, as a big problem as the pandemic. Uh, so we must uh, invest, I think, in trust uh, uh, during the pandemic and also between the pandemic uh, to, um, I mean, uh, reduce the gap between them, uh, recommendations, expert agencies, governance, and the civil society. And we know that trust is some, something that you can, of course, gain during pandemic, but if you don't work with trust, and trust is also often built by universal health coverage, etc., and other things, you cannot rely on trust during a pandemic. And then you have this infodemic and uh, uh, non-adherence to recommendations that is very important during uh, this kind of pandemic. We see that our trust has actually increased, uh, increased by many indicators. And one indicator in Sweden is that we have seen a significant increase in applications to medical programs in general university. So it's an increase by 30% uh, in young people applying to university programs to become doctors or nurses. And that's a really good, I mean, uh, outcome for us that so many more young people want to uh, contribute and join the healthcare workers workforce. So another lesson also connecting to healthcare workers is that health system is only as strong as its health workforce, I would say. And we know that uh, to give the best possible conditions to do the work is important during a pan pandemic. And we have a lot of learnings now how to deliver a patient-centered care, how we can uh, decrease administrative burdens and how we can facilitate better team-based care and also how to rely on digital tools to a higher extent because that's another frog leap in Sweden that we have seen such a giant increase of use of digital tools in primary healthcare or, and also in uh, follow-up of uh, patients with chronic diseases and every other care that we need to um, prioritize a bit lower, we went over to digital solutions instead. And these still solutions, the healthcare workforce in Sweden, they want them to stay and they also want this patient focus, frontline work to stay that we have used during the pandemic. So something happens when we focused on the uh, core values in our health systems. And uh, this brings me to my last point. And one of the lessons learned for us is that um, it's better to strengthen the collaborations we already had before the pandemic and to support each other in the systems instead of creating new and untested ways of working. So rely on what you have and also rely on a tight collaboration. And we need that both, I mean, in the, the local community, in regions, uh, between countries, in uh, our international community as well. So um, to sum up some learnings then, invest in public health, invest in trust, and also invest in strong collaboration. I think that has been uh, great things um, that has guided us in Sweden. Thank you. Olivia, thank you so much. I think that was again a very fascinating account and to hear it directly from you who is uh, actually one of the responsible, one of the leaders in the country is very important. I take just out a couple of points which I found very important. First of all, you said very early on we understood we need to have a sustainable solution because it's not going away. We need to learn 
to, to plan for longer term. Um, you were talking about scaling up public health systems, but also public health. And one of the issues I think which we probably want to discuss and explore a little uh, more in the discussion is you talked about knowledge-based and value-based decision-making, actually. And it would be interesting to see what's the knowledge behind and what's the value behind and uh, whether there's a combination actually available. And again, I think we clearly heard that the trust is the important thing, you know, and that you even uh, in the midst of a crisis can create more trust, but it must be substanti substantiated. And you said there are institutions behind it in our country. There's a health the welfare sector, as Hans Ulrich said, that you know it's uh, it's also about the welfare state actually, and uh, the last point which I also find very very important, and maybe we can also talk a little bit in the discussion about it, is the health workforce. Actually, many countries have done quite a lot of activity to strengthen the health workforce in this uh, in in this in this uh, very difficult pandemic. We have covered many of these responses in our um, uh, COVID-19 health systems response monitor, but that's a very fascinating area of discussion. I would now like to invite uh, Stefan Eichwalder from the Austrian Ministry of Health and uh, telling us a little bit the story, which has already kind of started with the video clip from uh, Minister Anschober. Stefan, the floor is all yours. Thank you, Matthias. Thank you, Lan and Matthias, for facilitating the, the this workshop this year. And uh, even though it's really a pity that we're not able to see um, um, the guests and, and the audience, um, I, I try to follow the chat as good as possible and we'll try to come to that. And otherwise, we'll try to be brief uh, just to make sure that we have enough uh, time for also some, some questions and some discussions uh, later on. Um, I want to start with the with the with two general uh, themes and topics. First of all, um, the the topic of resilience and health system resilience. And somehow, I, I must say, it's I, I often had difficulties with the word. And uh, most of us um, started to to use this this word, and it's kind of a buzzword that's coming and going and coming and going after the the financial crisis, right? And that was in particular with the, uh, on the European level, it was in particular with the uh, financial, after the aftermath of the financial crisis regarding also the European semester. And I think here clearly one, one, and I'm really glad that also the colleagues on the, on the European, uh, union level and from DG Sante and, and others and in member states that they're already after the financial crisis. There was a change in this discussion slightly, um, and coming, uh, becoming more and more important, uh, towards the, the, the health is wealth discussion that there is health is a, is an absolute prerequisite for, for everything else. And that really, um, far from being a burden as sometimes even portrait, the Europe's health systems are essential for everything else. And I think now, we clearly see that and this is not saying and i'm not saying we don't need to thrive to be more efficient and and more effective in our health systems but we see this absolute uh, necessity of strong and solitary uh, solitary uh, health systems and i think that was one of the of the of the main um, reasons why most of 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 the european or all of the uh, most of the european uh, countries came quite well through the crisis so far obviously that's that's a difficult term but still if we if we compare it um and the other um message that i want to take with me is the is the uh, topic of this year's gastein forum which is the dancing with elephants and clearly when 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 the when the theme was was uh invented kind of nobody thought about the the hem and the dance obviously but uh, as we also heard today i i think we really need to focus on on the on the on the dance part because the hammer is quite easy it's 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 radical in a way and it's, it has consequences that are that are um, uh, severe but it's so much harder the, as we see now to start again and to and to, to do this dance thing and I think there we really need to, uh, to uh, take every every uh, lesson learned and incorporate it very quickly to the to the um, Austrian system and coming to the to the definition of, of resilience I like the the definition Anna thank you. And I, I always looked at it as a way of, uh, as the ability of a system to adjust its functions prior to, during, and after a crisis or a change or a shock. And I think that's what we see now, right? I mean, the 
the, the, the adjusting prior to the pandemic is over. There, there was, uh, and that came in, in, in such an, speed and dynamic there was almost no no possibility to really adjust prior to the crisis but to set up uh, emergency response units etc so to change the way and our organizations in the ministries and in all the other relevant sectors in the hospitals etc but now we really are talking about resilience in a way um during the the pandemic and then also um following uh, the pandemic and i think that's where in the end we need to focus obviously uh, uh minister anshob already pointed out the 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 and i think there was a, a very personal uh, way of 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 describing the crisis in particular with his um um, um coming into office uh, just before the pandemic hit uh, europe and then kind of this need to adjust really quickly and then to say well actually yes i have my my top priorities we discussed uh, strengthening of primary healthcare before in a in a completely different uh, setting obviously and then needing to um uh, make sure that the, the the answers to the pandemic um, are appropriate and as good as possible. Because as was pointed out many times, I think really it's, it's about governance. It's not so much about are we a central or, or federal organized country. It's really about uh, governance. It's about communication. It's about trust. And uh, maybe a, a short personal uh, experience. I was um, I learned many new words that I obviously didn't know before and that this the chain of command and all this crisis management language is very direct and very very precise and i think it's necessary that it is that way and i was uh, responsible in the austrian um, ministry of health for the uh, securing the provision of medical goods and and making sure the capacities um are there that are needed and i have to say we didn't have uh, any experience that we could adjust it or that we could apply in the beginning about um, the the necessity of, of, of preparation. And I think that's something that is um, that we have always have to have in mind, because when we first started all the um, um, to ask all the hospitals and, and other important institutions in the health sector, all the, the, the outpatient sector, etc. What is needed, actually, what are the, the personal protective equipment and other uh, things that are needed, we, we got very low numbers in the beginning. And I think this is also showing the uncertainty that we have to deal with. And this makes it so difficult because I'm, I'm fully with you. We need to strengthen the link between science and, and policy to make sure we incorporate all the evidence that is out there. But this pandemic also showed that well, there is a need to act also without proper evidence that is there because it was not there. And I think it's we really need and 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 strengthen this part and as minister anshoba pointed out this this really direct um 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 uh, link between between the 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 uh, scientific community and 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 policy making so what we saw was and and maybe this is one point of view that i that i want to quickly make because i think it also showed uh, uh, something that was unprecedented First of all, we knew about the volatile global supply chains. We, we discussed the issue of shortages within medicines um, already before the crisis, and obviously that was intensified during the crisis. But we saw that particularly in other goods as well. And then on the other hand, um, we also saw, and that was really unprecedented and, and we did not expect that, new export regulations within the European Union. And I think also, again, here, it's, it's a matter of trust and we really need to make sure all together as, as member states of the European Union that um, we do not allow such um, um, policy developments again. I think this is really, we need a strong European Union and we'll come to that uh, part later on. So uh, we, we, we need to uh, take our lessons from that to be prepared because as, uh, as a strong um, prime, uh, strong health system is, is a prerequisite for um, economic uh, success. It is also the, the, the supply of basic goods that is needed um, to make sure that provision can take care. The other very personal point I want to make, and this is um, this was somewhat surprising to me, but maybe it's and obviously it's also a consequence of that, is that we saw maybe not so much international cooperation. We saw it on many levels, but in some ways, I think the challenge was much more the same obviously than than we typically face and still we we didn't see that intense um international particular european cooperation than one might expect 
And I think that is one of the, of, was one of the weaknesses in the, in the first phase inside and outside the health sector, looking at travel warnings and others, um, developments outside the health sector, but then also obviously in the, in the health sector. So I think really we need to focus. How can we make sure to come as good through the crisis? And, uh, as Hans Ulrich and Olivia already pointed out, uh, Olivia pointed out, we are, we are in the midst of it. We are, we are not talking about, well, um, reaching the end of the pandemic soon. So I think we need to strengthen, obviously, uh, the international cooperation. And there was also a question in the, in the chat. How can we really do that? And I think the joint procurement of vaccines is one of the examples where we need to also, again, build trust among, uh, the, the member states. Uh, I already pointed out the importance of the dance now and, and not only the dance with the elephants, but really with the virus. <laughs> um, and we, we need to, consider and look much closer to possibly adverse effects if we don't manage um, the provision of care well. We need to protect the health professionals and, and the institutions, but we also need to make sure that um, people, chronic uh, ill patients and others get the treatment they need. Otherwise, we have effects that are maybe even worse than, than, than the direct effects from, from the pandemic. So what I want to take uh, with me and maybe really uh, using for, for a discussion I think we need to focus on, on, on what can we learn now for the crisis and to come through the crisis, but then also what do we need to do after the crisis to make sure our health system is as resilient as possible. Um, we, we know that lockdown with all the consequences was a, was a measure, but we also know, and this is, this is, um, I think no, everyone would agree, even though we see Again, the discussion of, of really strong measures in that regard. I didn't hear that from, from, from the colleagues and I'm sure we, we share that opinion. We cannot go into a complete lockdown. We need to do everything possible to uh, not have a complete lockdown because of all the adverse effects and, and consequences of it. Uh, we need to make sure that we also look at our strategies all the time. And I'm, uh, this was one of the questions, um, from, from the chat and, and one of the questions I even I uh, wanted to ask Anzulich uh, myself was the role of, of primary healthcare because for us, that was one of, of our main um, policy agenda. That was one of our main policy of agendas to strengthen primary healthcare. We saw that obviously um, strong and, and multidisciplinary um, health primary healthcare units in Austria were able to manage the crisis and to provide care during the crisis much better than others in many ways because well, they are bigger. They have they have a multitude of health professionals on on board, etc. So I think it was uh, that was important to see. We obviously didn't expect primary healthcare to take on this role, but uh, that was an important one. Um, from from my point of view, uh, we need and and I also said that information, almost live information about the capacity and and what is going on in the health system. And I think again, this is not a question of of of, of well, obviously, fragmentation isn't making it easier, maybe, but it's not um, um, really an obstacle to that. So we know uh, that we have more than 2,000 intensive care beds, and most, uh, a lot of them available for the, for the time being, also for COVID patients, 40,000 beds, and we see that almost in a live version. We didn't have that information before, and it's absolutely necessary to strengthen also that. And somehow the pandemic uh, served as a fast-forward mode for e-health, I would say, and we also need to make sure that we take... Um, with us, what we what we learned from there. Uh, again, it ta it takes a strong European answer. I think the member states in, in, within the European Union typically are too small, yeah, to and we cannot solve the pandemic uh, on a, based on on a, on a country focus because it's a pandemic. That's that's the definition of it. And there are strong answers to the crisis by the European Union. Only um, um, talking about the recovery and. Re resilience facility that is in uh, about to be implemented with 670 billion euros. I think that's important uh, aspects. Thank I'm, I'm, I'm my last sentence. And what I worry and what I think we need to make sure is uh, it's time to act now and time to make sure that those strategies and plans um, are being implemented. And that's my worry because we all are challenged within the pandemic, but we need also to think about the time after the pandemic.
Thanks. Thank you so much, Stefan. I could listen to all the panelists actually all morning. It's quite fascinating to hear. And I have um, many, many questions. Just to reiterate, I mean, you, you also emphasized governance, communication, and trust as key values. I would like also to highlight, and this resonates with very much what your minister says and um, Hans Ulrich at the beginning, that there's the need to act even if you don't have the evidence, you know? So having no evidence is no excuse for um, not um, acting. And what I found very interesting in yours and what was not mentioned so much in the other presentation was that you were focusing also on the international European dimension. So you said, we knew before that the supply chains are quite vulnerable. We didn't do anything about it. There were export regulation on personal uh, protective equipment, which was questionable, you know, in the beginning. And um, there is uh, not so much uh, international cooperation as foreseen. There was in the end some German, uh, Germany treated some patients from uh, countries surrounding it, but it's true there was not so much um, uh, response in this regard. Thank you so much to all three panelists, uh, fantastic talks. And now I hand over to um, Ilana and Ilana will try to um, come up with a couple of questions from the from the chat, which is a challenge because the chat seems to explode. Actually, there's quite a lot in it. Please, Ilana. The there is quite, yeah. Thank you. There is quite a lot in it. That's true, and uh, I'm really excited that people are asking the questions. I apologize that we cannot ask and forward all these questions, but I try to summarize it a little bit. And there are a few general questions. Um, first one would be on communication, the role of communication in crisis management and in, in increasing resilience. Um, on one hand, when it comes to trust building, which all of you mentioned, um, and uh, we face here the challenge of fake news and conspiracy. So how do you deal with that and how do you increase the trust building? But also the communication with patients and also with the health healthcare staff. And here, uh, primary healthcare was also mentioned. How do you communicate in, in crisis time so that um, the healthcare services uh, are provided and that patients also know what to do? Um, in regards to international collaboration, what uh, Stefan also here mentioned, um, there was the question, how do you deal or how do you um, combine, uh, on one hand, international cooperation, but on the other hand, uh, the nationality that is so strong during the crisis um, where obviously there are also national uh, measures and, uh, and different uh, responses. And one last question which is uh, for everyone was in regards to uh, best practice for uh, the continuity of uh, healthcare services such as uh, introducing telemedicine or at home administration of medication. Um, they want to know if this is applied in your country and how do you um, how do you uh, see these options uh, that uh, continuity of um, services can be guaranteed during the time of crisis. One specific question for Olivia was um, um, several times asked, which is uh, the high mortality rate in Sweden. Um, that is. Um, that, that is, um, I guess, uh, a challenge, obviously. And uh, for Hans Ulrich, uh, if there would be um, uh, any I, uh, any thoughts about how to get ahead of the pandemic and to reduce the second wave, is there a way to get uh, ahead of the pandemic? So maybe we start with Hans Ulrich and then with Olivia and Stefan. Okay. Can you hear me? Okay, then, then I start with the easiest question, uh, how to prevent the second wave. <laughs> uh, obviously, uh, there is no clear solution to that. Um, we are seeing uh, neighboring countries like France and Spain, they are already experiencing the second wave with a higher case count than they had during March uh, already. So. Um, we are in a, in a better situation. We have a, a slow rise in cases. We have nearly no cases, uh, if you compare it to March, in the hospitals because the age range of the infected people at the moment in Germany is much younger, much lower than it was during the first phase uh, of the, of the uh, pandemic. Um, what we are doing uh, is we haven't eased all the lockdown measures uh, that we had uh, installed. Uh, in March already. So there is still uh, a prohibition of mass gatherings, uh, the, the clubs and dance clubs and, and um, um, 
they are closed. I mean, I'm, I'm speaking from Berlin, the, the capital of dance, of electron, electronic music. Uh, they are all shut down. Um, and it's very hard for the, the club owners uh, to, to cope with the situation. But as we know that there are specific um, dangers for super spreading events, of course, we try to prevent these super spreading events. Uh, a second measure that we have taken, we have uh, built up a monitoring system uh, in, the, in the federal level, on the county level, so that we, as, as in Austria, you have the Ampel system, uh, which, uh, which I find very interesting. Uh, we have uh, nearly the same, we don't call it Ampel system, but of course we have put some, uh, some incidence rates, we're talking about um, incidence rate uh, per seven days, per 100,000 people. Uh, that give us a warning site uh, and some that give the red light and then measures have to be taken which is uh, uh, advised by uh, through the, the federal government here in berlin and then the local public health authorities or primary uh, healthcare system they are supported from uh, centrally supported we have built up some reserve capacity within our national public health institute like task force uh, which will be, be deployed uh, into situations when they are called. Um, we even have uh, um, in, the, in the federal system, the last resort would be, which is used in, in uh, other countries as well, we have trained uh, the military uh, for contact tracing and, uh, and um, helping uh, in, in call centers and so on. Uh, and the, the different counties, they can indicate if they need this help. So they get uh, support from this, uh, from this reserve. Um, and uh, yes, we, there are some restrictions on, on private uh, gatherings uh, in, uh, in uh, the public uh, space or even in private space, which were installed just yesterday in preparation for uh, fall winter. So um, what we have learned is that there are certain uh, circumstances which lead to high infection rates and we try to prevent this. Um, and what, uh, what Stefan said is ab absolutely clear. We want to prevent a second lockdown. We want to prevent the impact on the economy because this, this is the second crisis which will follow this health crisis is the economic crisis. Uh, and therefore, I think we have learned um, in the last months how to tackle this uh, best, uh, specific uh, reasons. If we will succeed, uh, we, will, we, will ca we can discuss next year when we're through this. Um, but I wish us all the best. Uh, and uh, I think uh, one point Stefan just pointed out very clearly, international cooperation. Um, I, I was in telephone conferences with, with many of your countries and I, I really find it very helpful to exchange views, to exchange uh, opinions, to see what measures are taken because we all can learn from each other um, in, in, in different uh, areas. And um, I hope that we continue to do this in an in international uh, coordinated and, and communicative uh, way. Thank you. Fantastic. We are running out of time, so it would be fantastic if we have short answers. Thank you so much, Hans Ulrich. And Olivia, maybe you can continue. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> I think it's good, good uh, topics to raise. And when it comes to communication, uh, daily cross press conference has been keen because there we can tell I mean, uh, fact-based versions, but there are always, there are rumors, fake news, and with the media um, surrounding or um, society that uh, is so, inf I mean, uh, uh, reliant on also what's on social media, it's almost, I mean, it's an area we have to learn a lot more about because we are still working with traditional media and had that kind of thinking. So we have to learn a more, lot more about how to stop rumors and how to act on them and how to track them. International collaboration, I would say that Sweden pushed very strong, uh, I mean, all the time that we had to have open border, borders and collaborate because we know that we are interlinked and we know that if we closed our borders, it will hit back on us because a product is not done within one country, it's done within 20 different countries. <laughs> um, high mortality rates, we have a government commission, uh, commission now that is looking into that because we need, I mean, more of a national answer on that, but some factors have been raised in the discussion, that is the, the fact that one million people were traveling across borders during February and uh, uh, February, March. So we are a traveling people and the pandemic uh, came in uh, with those tourists or uh, 
tourists from Sweden that traveled abroad to many different countries. Another fact that we have that's been raised in discussion is that our nursing homes are, have workforce that are not, uh, not having enough high education level language skills or routines and organization was not there. Uh, during March, April, and now it's a totally different uh, setting in the nursing homes. And another factor that has been raised in the, deb the debate is that we have a very decentralized system. So it's very hard for us to coordinate it with 290 local municipalities. We're responsible for um, healthcare system the, uh, for elderly and 21 different regions with the responsible for financing and um, purchasing and uh, running uh, health deliv um, delivery. So it has been sometimes difficult to coordinate national initiatives like testing and tracing, etc. And those are different factors that have been mentioned, but a commission will look into that. The first report will come in November and uh, 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 reports will be carried on during next uh, year as well. Thank you. Thank you, Libya, and, and, and thanks to all, and uh, a particular thanks to um, all the people who, who joined the session and who also um, raised so many questions that we, that we, and this is a pity, cannot all go through, but I think they really show the, the, the importance of many of the aspects that has, have been discussed here today. Now, coming to the, to the two or three questions that, or patterns of, of questions with the increasing trust, and I think, yes, this is, uh, increasing trust towards the public, obviously, and and finding new ways to communicate. And um, this is, as Olivia also mentioned, uh, we maybe as health ministers uh, ministries typically are not too social media affine and 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 uh, often relied on 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 very uh, yeah other ways of of communication. And this maybe was also never a role. I think we have to be careful what really the role of, a, of an authority of a health ministry and, and other authorities in that area is. But what we saw was that that really play, made a difference. First, the, the minister is, is, is uh, uh, very active on, on social media. He has a strong team in that regard, and that helped a lot to reach other uh, people, obviously, that typically by uh, the, the ways of, of interaction that we use, we're not able to, to uh, reach. I think we need to focus much more also and, and, and much stronger on the, on the, on the communication with the health providers, with the people who actually do the work, right? And who we rely so much upon and to make sure that they have the information and the support that they need. And this is, um, I can only, uh, share your, your view from, uh, Sweden with a decentralized system. Obviously, sometimes not easier because there are so many stakeholders but the good thing is they are very close sometimes so there are pros and cons but i think here also maybe this traffic light approach that uh, austria introduced with the ample system as hans ulrich uh, pointed out can serve as an example an interesting example for a couple of things first of all it's about transparency it's about giving more information about uh, the actual um, activity of the virus and i think this is also important for the individual health professionals to know actually what is the risk and, and what is the uh, dynamic in, in, in the activity of the virus. So that's, that's, uh, and that was not here before in Austria. And this is now accessible for the district. On the other hand, it shows the importance of, of, of how to introduce these new measures, um, and, and how they are used. And then also, uh, again, science and, and politics, where we saw at the beginning that it's quite difficult with these new measures. Uh, increased transparency, how to deal with that. It can we really say an automatism of, well, this uh, district turns to yellow and these are the, the measures to follow. I think we need to have uh, uh, flexibility. And this is also what was pointed out from the German experience in having some, some, some regular set of, of measures uh, that we need, but then really looking at the very, and even uh, in a small country like Austria, that is important to really go down to the regional level and have the flexibility there if there is a necessity to adopt the measures. Yeah, And I think this is going to be crucial because the pandemic is here to stay and we need to learn to live with it. Thank you. Um, my side and, and back to you, Matthias. <laughs>
<laughs> Thank you so much. And again, you know, this debate is fascinating and we are very happy about the many comments we got. We are very unhappy that we can only put a couple of them on the table. We've talked about um, the resilience as a concept. And uh, although we focused this time very much on the governance aspect, we also had a little bit of a talk on the on the um, uh, capacity, in particular hospital, hospital beds and the health workforce. Probably in the near future, we will talk much more about funding and financing because of the tax link, uh, dwindling tax revenues and the problems for um, con uh, sickness fund contribution. In any case, um, uh, Stefan, I'm glad that you get used to the um, term resilience, even though you didn't like it in the beginning, because I think we need to deal with it in the future as uh, one of the major instruments for uh, dealing with this crisis is called actually recovery and a resilience facility and that is part of the eu response you know of the joint response to the fallout of this um, crisis so these are my final words and i now hand over to ilana to close the session or to have a final word as well thank you so much and thank you very much for participating thank you matthias and in the name of the ministry i also want to thank our participants um our speakers um this amazing interactive uh, communication thank you so much for your questions and apologies for not being able to ask or forward these to everyone i think that uh, in this type of uh, exchange and lessons learned uh, exchange is really crucial it's so valuable as our minister said there's no way we can get through this crisis by ourselves. We need to have this exchange and knowledge, knowledge exchange to be more resilient. And in that sense, I wish you all a really good day and please stay safe. And greetings from Vienna. <laughs> Goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye.